So, Matthew. I, I always say this, but it is the best book in the Bible, I think. It's got the best name, at least. just have to say that. So we've been going through the book of Matthew for the last couple of months now, really. And I think we're really starting to understand what it is that Matthew is trying to get at when he brings us these stories. He has so much... It's quite a different book to some of the other Gospels, and I think he has a very different focus. And we've seen that a lot of his focus was towards the Jewish people at the time. And in that, he would often go back to the Old Testament and say, well, this is where God said this was going to happen. This is how Jesus has fulfilled it. And we keep seeing that time and time and time again. And as we've seen that, we've seen that Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah is the Savior that the Jewish people had been waiting for. God had promised that they would have a Savior, and Jesus was that Savior. He was the person who had come to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And the kingdom of God is another big word. Now, anyone here last week, what is kingdom? Rule and reign of God. Thank you, Wendy. I am going to destroy some of them at some point. And what is the gospel of the kingdom? Good news of the rule and reign of God. Excellent. People were listening last week, Chris. So we got to see all of that last week, and we've seen through the past weeks that Jesus was baptized, and when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him like a dove. He went into the wilderness. He was tempted by the devil. We got to see how he responded to that. And we get to see that his main message really is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that is the good news of the rule and reign of God. Repent, turn away from what you're doing, because the good news of the kingdom of God is here. So today we're going to continue on that. We're going to go into the rest of Matthew 4. Chris went through Matthew 4, 12 to 17, and 23 to the end of Matthew 4 last week. And I'm going to do the bit that he skipped. So if you would like to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And we're going to start there. While walking by the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left their boat and their father, and followed him. Let's start at the very beginning, while walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now, where is the Sea of Galilee? I'm sure all of you can guess. It is in the Holy Land. It is in what we call Israel. And I've just put a little map on the screen there where you can see Jerusalem's highlighted kind of in the middle. And then you go right to the top. That's Galilee. That's where Jesus lived. And we can zoom in on that area a little bit. And you'll get to see that Nazareth, which is the one in the kind of bottom left, uh, that was where Jesus was raised as a child. And you, you, know, you can see the distance from Jerusalem that was. And the, the path that's on the screen is the, probably the journey Jesus took when he moved earlier in Matthew chapter 4 from Nazareth to Capernaum, which is right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And that's where this story takes place. Now, the Sea of Galilee is, it's not really a sea, it's actually, it's a lake, but the word used was kind of interchangeable at that point in some languages. And you will see that, you won't see unfortunately, it's apparently an extremely beautiful area, but I couldn't find any photos that I was allowed to put up on a PowerPoint and on YouTube. And so, when you get the chance, go home, Google what the Sea of Galilee looks like, or if people, have, and some people here have been there, so talk to them. And Capernaum was right on the shore. It was an extremely beautiful area, but it was also an extremely warm area because it was kind of set down below sea level and ringed by mountains. But what that meant is it was extremely fertile. And the lake was full of fish, hence the fishermen. So the two main trades were kind of that farming and the fishermen, and you got both of them together. 
and this story takes place around the fisherman. So, that's the scene. Going back to our passage, you might have noticed when we were reading through it, there's kind of two um, parts to this passage, and it kind of splits right in the middle, at kind of verse 21, I think it is. And I'll just show you on the screen. And what happens is this verse splits, and there's kind of two parallel stories that are happening right together that are very, very similar. You have one with Peter and Andrew. I don't know whether to call him Simon or Peter. We'll get to that in a minute. And then John and James on the other side. And what it essentially breaks down into, uh, I've numbered the different things that happen. The first one, Jesus saw two brothers doing their jobs. He called them in the second one. And the third one is they immediately stopped what they were doing and followed him. Now, because it's in very identical passages, I'm obviously going to say the sermon once and then go back and say it all again to, uh, you know, just to make sure I get that second thing. I'll only go through it once, don't worry. You'll get your tea and coffee. So if we go to that first bit, so what I've done is I've highlighted the, the sections that we're going to look at. So Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And the second part, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his older brother, no, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. We often, I don't know about you, but whenever I've read this story before, I've often looked at it and gone, wow, Jesus just walked up to these random men and went, come, follow me. And they were like, okay, we'll just stop what we're doing, carry on. But actually, looking into this, that's not what happened, and I can't believe that I've believed that for so long, when if I'd paid attention in the other Gospels, I might have noticed that when John talks about... I'm having people signal at me, and I'm not sure what. Handheld. Right, let's try that. Is that better? Yes? Amazing. Right. Do I have to start again now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the two brothers, the, the four fishermen, and I often thought that it was the first time Jesus had seen them. But actually, when we look in John's gospel, John, James and John, same John, we get to see that actually uh, John 1, verse 35, I'll read it to you. The next day, again, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be Cephas, which means Peter. So Andrew knew Jesus, and Simon, Peter, knew Jesus. What about James and John? Now, some scholars, no one's really sure when all of this happened, what the exact timeline is. Some scholars estimate it was up to a year between this first meeting of Jesus and then what we see in Matthew's Gospel. And again, I'm going to go into Luke now, and Luke's version of events is slightly different, but again, probably happened around the same time, but not exactly. So in Luke chapter 5, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. Same thing, different name, no idea why. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out on them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Simon, who we'd met before, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they'd done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both their boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, 
for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee. Remember them? Who were partners with Simon and presumably Andrew. And Jesus said to them, said to Simon, do not be afraid, for now you will be catching men. And the next verse says that uh, Simon left everything and followed Jesus. Now, like I say, we don't know exactly what the timeline was there, but it was probably around the same time. So when we go back to Matthew and see the story, and Jesus walks along the shore and meets these random people and says, oh, come follow me. Actually, there's a whole backstory to it that I admit I didn't know until I started reading this, but it made so much more sense. And I think, I mean, initially I was disappointed. I was like, well, oh, it was kind of nice thinking that Jesus just walked up and he had this, this draw on him. But we do see in other parts of the Bible, it says that he was unremarkable. There was nothing particularly amazing about looking at him. So it did always kind of make me wonder what really happened there. But then I started to think about it and it made me realize actually it shows more of God, I think, more of his character that he didn't just walk up to people and go, you'll do. He actually got to know these people. He'd interacted with them. He would randomly renamed one of them, but we'll get to that in a few weeks' time. Stay tuned. And it made me think, yeah, actually, he does that a lot more than we probably realize. He, he doesn't just pick people and go, you'll do. He really, God is really intentional about the things he asks us to do and the places he asks us to go. And yet, the more and more and more I thought about that, I just thought, God doesn't just appear and ask us to blindly believe in him. A lot of people throw that accusation around, that Christianity is blind faith. It's not based on anything, which I understand because you can't measure God scientifically. He doesn't weigh anything. Well, Jesus did, but, you know, he's not... Now Jesus has ascended and we have the Spirit and God is with us all the time. There's no scientific way to measure him. Which, so I understand that the blind faith idea, but actually, God doesn't ask us to go in blindly. God gets to know us. He builds a relationship with us. He shows us his power like he showed Simon and the other fishermen that they were throwing their nets over. They'd caught nothing. And they threw their nets over in a place at a time that, when you understand that story, the time of day was wrong, the place they were in was wrong. Nothing about that should have led to a good catch of fish, but it led to the best catch of fish because Jesus was showing himself, showing that he could be trusted. So I don't think it's fair to say we rely on blind faith because anyone who has faith knows that you don't go into this hoping like Lisa was talking about earlier, it's, it's that relationship. You know that God's got you. Even when you don't feel safe in your own hands, you know you can be safe in God's because he proves it time and time and time again to us. And if you don't believe me, just try praying about things. Try praying about just normal things in life. I'm not saying start praying for a Ferrari and a free home in the south of France and all those kind of things. I mean, he could do. But generally, he doesn't really seem to work like that, unfortunately. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> a lot of us have done the, the Bible course, and I can't remember whether it was in the course, but in the book that Pete Gregg wrote, there's a, a quote. I think it's, it's either from Count Zinzendorf or someone like that. And it says, when I pray coincidences happen. When I stop praying, they stop happening. And that's been my journey. I've, I often really struggle to point to big things that God's done. Like this, I've not had a miraculous catch of fish. But all through my life, there have always been coincidences, things happening, and things that I've prayed for, and then something happens. Or a couple of weeks ago, I shared about Amelia in my new car. It's not a Ferrari, but it is it was incredible because it was just God's perfect timing in that. But it was a complete coincidence. And, uh, you know, God incidents, as, as some people call them. 
And that's so much of what our life is about, that it's not blind faith. It's not just wandering blindly, hoping that God will catch us. It's about doing these things, spending time with him, praying to him, asking him for things, and trusting that he will do it, and seeing when he does. So yeah, if you, if you don't believe that it's, it's not blind faith, then maybe just try praying. Try asking God for some things in your life. Just try asking for, inviting him into everyday parts of your life. And it doesn't always make it easy. It doesn't always make life easy. But he's always there. He's always listening. So when he does call us, like the, the four, the, the two Peza brothers, when he does call us to drop everything, it's not out of nowhere. It's not because he just felt like wandering along the beach and picking some random people. He does all of this because he loves us and because he knows us. So don't, don't underestimate what he will do through you and your relationship with him. Like I said, Simon and Andrew could have been waiting up to a year for Jesus to call. They just went back to their normal jobs. And they knew that he was probably going to do something special at some point. But they were just doing what they were supposed to do. They were working hard. They were earning a living. They were supporting their families. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But what this story really shows us is that when you're doing that, when you're just living life from day to day, and it is boring or monotonous or difficult or all of those other things that life just is because it seems to be that way, you don't know when Jesus is going to turn up and say, it's time. So be ready. Don't, don't get bogged down in the mundane. I'm speaking as much to myself as anyone else. Because Jesus will come round and he will come and say, follow me. And when he does, what are we following him into? The next part of the passage, for, for both sets of brothers, he said, and follow me. For uh, James and John, it, Matthew just records, and he called them, but he probably said the same thing to them. He probably said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that term, fishers of men, literally, it means fishermen of men. There's nothing particularly special. It probably sounds better in English than in Greek. But that's what Jesus said. He said, I will make you fishers of men, and the word men means mankind, not just men, you know. The church doesn't just need to have men in. Just in case any of you wonder, no. So yeah, he probably said the same to James and John. But why these men? We've said that he got to know them already, he'd, he'd met them before, we don't know what their relationship was. But why these particular men? I think Jesus knew what he was doing. That's a shocking statement, isn't it? I think Jesus knew what he was doing. But, you know, you often think, if you're going to go and pick your elite team of your first disciples, the people you want to follow you, which, by the way, in Jewish culture was, you know, almost unheard of. Normally the student picked the rabbi, their teacher, that they would follow. But actually with Jesus, he worked the other way which I think is really, really interesting. With just Jesus does so many things that because we live here and now, we often don't see the, the significance, the cultural significance of them. But yeah, why, why these men? They weren't particularly well-educated. They weren't particularly rich. They were probably business owners, so probably had a little bit of money, but enough to support themselves and their families and their workers, but probably not a lot left after that. I mean, they wouldn't have been stupid men either because they're, they're fishermen. I don't know about you, but when you look at what they have to do, they would go out in their boats, find exactly the right place to put their nets down and take these massive circular nets that were weighted with lead, throw them overboard, let them settle on the bottom, and then pull them back up. It was really hard work. I couldn't do it. Just that constant, you're pulling it up, nothing this time. Throw it again. Pull it up. Sounds a bit like life, doesn't it? Throwing the net out and trying to pull it back up and nothing's happened. And fry again. 
I think that's why Jesus chose these people. They were brave because they had to weather the storms on the Sea of Galilee. They were persistent because they had to keep throwing their nets out and pulling them back up. There was something else, and I've completely lost where I am in my notes. That'll come to me in a second. Oh, strategic, because they would have to know the best places to find the fish at the right times of day. I think that's why Jesus chose these men, because they were ordinary men. They weren't massively educated. They weren't going to go and try and lecture everyone and, and be big preachers and, and all of these kind of things. They were real people, real hardworking people who had all the right skills to be able to go into a crowd of people and go, where's the best place to go? What's the best thing for me to say? That didn't work. I'll try again. That didn't work. I'll try again. I think it was brilliant. Because he could have gone for any of the teachers or the lawyers or the well-paid people in the region, and he didn't. Jesus chooses normal people to do extraordinary things. I mean it, absolutely extraordinary. You think about these four people. Between them, they wrote multiple bits of the New Testament. Three of them were in Jesus' inner circle, were there on the night that he was crucified. One of them is the patron saint of Scotland, apparently. But between the four of them, they've made an impact that has lasted for over 2,000 years. But they were ordinary people. They weren't extraordinary people. And I think we do that sometimes. We often, especially in a kind of celebrity culture we have, we look at the big churches and see the big pastors on the stage with all the lights and the smoke machines and everything going on and think, they must be amazing people. Some of them are probably less nice than you'd want to think. But we had a guy come in this week at work uh, and he was giving a sermon. He's got a big church in France. Uh, it was a great message, but meeting him the day after, you realize that he's just a normal bloke. He's got kids, he's got a wife, he's got a mortgage, he's got bills to pay. A really nice, humble bloke. But God's using him for extraordinary things. And I'm sure it's true of many other celebrity pastors and big pastors as well. But you often see it a lot more in small, small churches. I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful of Chris. I'm not just saying that because I'm here and I can. I genuinely mean it. He's a really down-to-earth guy. You're ordinary, Chris. But that's what Jesus does. He chooses ordinary people. And we believe that we're going to see extraordinary things. But why fishers of men? What's the imagery there? Obviously, they were fishermen. It's what they knew. It's what they understood. But why fishers of men? I think Jesus chose that for a very specific reason. If you think about what fishing is, I don't know how many of you have gone fishing. I find it really boring, but some people love it. But this wasn't leisurely fishing. This wasn't uh, going out and sitting by the lake for a day with your nice canvas recliner chair and throwing your nets out, lines, rods, whatever. You can see I don't fish very often. I, like I said, this was hard work, and they weren't catching for sport. They weren't catching for fun. They were catching because they needed to kill these fish to eat them to survive or to sell them to buy other food to survive. So when they were thinking, we're fishing men, their first thought was probably, if we're catching men, what are we doing with them? They weren't killing them to eat them. I can tell you that. Jesus used this, I think, because he could really show the difference that when you fish for fish, you, you bring up this live fish that flops around and is a bit chaotic, and you kill it for whatever it needs to go on to next. Sorry if anyone's vegan listening or... Sorry. But the complete opposite is true in this case. When you fish for men, they're not alive. When we go to people who don't know Jesus, the Bible says that these people are spiritually dead. And that's what's so amazing about this idea of fishing for men. 
It's not about bringing up something alive and making it dead. It's about bringing up something dead and making it alive. I think that's just incredible that this is what our life is. We were dead in our sins. Jesus made us alive. And not only that, not only does Jesus make the fish alive, he turns that fish into a fisherman to go and make more fish. Men. You know what I mean? Thank you. And that next step, Jesus has brought us up, whether he's used fishermen. Many of us here have been in meetings with people like Reinhard Bonnke and Billy Graham and all those kind of big name evangelists. But also lots of us have been impacted by the lives of just normal, faithful Christians spreading the good news. Maybe it's our parents. Maybe it's someone we work with. And all they did was just show us the gospel, teach us who Jesus was. And in that, they were making us from dead to alive. They were being fishers of men. But the next step, that's only half the journey. The next step to being alive, you then become a fisher yourself. Not like Andy, but a fisher of men. And that's something Jesus does. Because in this statement, he says, I will make you fishers of men. It's not we will make ourselves fishers of men. Charles Spurgeon put it like this. When Christ calls us by his grace, we ought not only to remember what we are, but we ought also to think of what he can make us. It is follow me because of what you already are. It is not follow me, because you may make something of yourself, but it is follow me, because of what I will make you. It's not what we do to ourselves. It's not what we already are. It's what Jesus is going to make us. We've got no power to do anything ourselves. These four fishermen didn't have any power to do anything themselves. It's only through Jesus that it's possible. It's only because they were able to follow him to follow in his footsteps. We can try and live our own way. We can try and achieve heaven through doing good things, through being nice people. But when you read the Bible, it makes it really clear that every good work we do is like a filthy rag. It's not good enough for God because it's not about what we can do and what we are. It's about what Jesus did. Jesus died on that cross. Jesus made us pure not through anything we could do, not through our own efforts, like Wendy read out earlier. It's a gift of God. Only Jesus can take a dead fish and make a living fisherman. And when you've experienced that, why wouldn't you want to be a fisherman as well? We see next from their, from their reaction, they drop their nets. Immediately they left their nets because they knew what Jesus had done to them. They saw who he was, that he was the Messiah, the Savior that they'd been waiting for. And they knew that if he could do that for them, he could do so much more. And I think for every one of us, when we've seen what Jesus has done, when he's taken us from a dead fish to being alive again, we know that he can go even further and make us a fisher of men. And why wouldn't we want to share that experience, share that good news, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, good news of the rule and reign of God? If your life has been changed, surely you'd want to transform others as well. It's interesting because he said, follow me and I will make you. He didn't say, I'm going to put you on a training course and they'll make you. He said, I will make you. So not only is it nothing we can do, it's only something Jesus can do. So immediately they left their nets. How many of you, I know Jesus was amazing and miraculous and, and all those things, but how many of you really, if you're honest, if Jesus walked up now and said, leave your job or you're going to go away from your family for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time or you're not going to get paid anything for the next 
however long, because I want you to come and follow me. How easy would it be for you to just go, yeah, okay. Really been thinking about that this week. And it's really, really difficult. We get nice and comfortable in our jobs. We get nice and comfortable in what we're doing. You want these fishermen? Immediately they left. The boys left their father. We know that Peter left his wife, not left his wife. Went away for a little bit and came back and went. Jesus isn't trying to break up families. He's not. Jesus loves the family. But he's also saying, when I call you to do what I call you to do, be ready to drop everything. Thankfully, he often doesn't ask us to drop everything. Thankfully, he normally lets us keep some things. But if he did ask us to drop everything, as he has for many people, could you? I'm not sure I could, honestly. Uh, Early 20th century British preacher uh, G. Campbell Morgan said this. The greatest rewards that will ever come to churches or to men will be bestowed not according to the greatness of the strength they had or the greatness of the opportunity as it appeared to men, but according to the fidelity to opportunity and full use of the measure of of strength possessed. I didn't really understand that, to be honest. So I may have asked AI to help me translate it. When God presents us with an opportunity, the best rewards come from taking hold of that opportunity with both hands. It may not look like the most amazing opportunity to others, but God rewards us based on our faithfulness to him, not based on what others think. When God presents us with an opportunity, the best rewards come from taking hold of that opportunity with both hands. It may not look like the most amazing opportunity to others, but God rewards us based on our faithfulness to him, not based on what others think. God's opportunities can look crazy. It can look, it can look like it doesn't make sense to everyone else. But immediately they left. Immediately they put down their nets. And I just wonder... Is God asking you to put down your nets and pick up your mission? This group is often seen as the first church, the first kingdom fellowship of people that are following Jesus. They started a legacy that 2,000 years later, you and I are still part of. And that was because they put down their nets and they picked up their mission. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus calls us to all sorts of things. He calls us to be fishers of men. For some people, that calling is their first calling. It might be the first time you've heard the message of Jesus and what he can do in your life. Or it might be that you've known him for years and years and years and years, and you're wondering what the next steps are. But I'm just asking you now, spend a few minutes. I'm going to pray, and then we can close. Just spend a few minutes thinking, what is Jesus calling me to do? Maybe it's to talk to that coworker. Maybe it's to check your budget and see if you really need to spend that the way you are. Maybe it's to give your life to him for the first time, or recommit your life if you've wandered away. Immediately, they dropped their nets and followed him. Thank you, Lord, that we get to read your word, that we get to see your amazing stories, your amazing, miraculous encounters with these people. And thank you that not only do we get to read it, we get to be a part of it. You invite us to follow you. And I pray for everyone here and everyone online that as we take a moment to reflect on this, You will show us what you want us to do next. You will show us the nets you want us to drop and show us how to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.